Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Long Box Carpentry. I am Noel, and joining me, as always, is JD. Hello. How you been, JD? I'm good. Let's talk some Halloween. Yes, let's talk some Halloween comics, indeed. So in our last episode, we covered the first three Halloween comics released by Chaos Comics that were interesting in that they were trying to follow H2O while also incorporating elements of 4, 5, and 6, and This is where we have the start of what is now called the H2O universe, where it's now become this continuity where it's just part one, part two, H2O, and we'll see in later versions if Resurrection is also included in there, but it's just picking up directly off H2O, four, five, and six never happened. This is kind of our new focusing on the main trilogy. Yeah. Admittedly, at the time, that was the logic because that was what the films were doing, but I don't know. I still have a little bit of a soft spot for those films. Yeah. Even Six, as problematic as it was, I kind of like that continuity. And admittedly, you're losing a great actor like Donald Pleasance, so I kind of felt a little bad when H2O chose to ignore all that. I understand why they did it, though, but... But yeah, and I know that was one of the big things about H2O, where they were going to slip in references, but they could just never figure out why Laurie would leave Jamie behind. And that was their main reason for why they decided not to. Makes sense. And I know Stephen Hutchinson, who wrote all of the comics that we're going to be talking about over the next two episodes. These are all written by Stephen Hutchinson. His big contention is that he just didn't feel you could make the continuities work between the two films. I don't entirely agree, but I'm sure it's something we'll discuss. Yeah, I think you could if you wanted to, but the amount of work that would maybe require to explain... Would be significantly less than your average issue of X-Men. Right. (laughs) But it still would be... You'd have to take time to explain why Lori would abandon Jamie. You could explain that away, but the amount of energy that would be required to explain it away would not necessarily be worth your time. Yeah. So yeah, so what we're covering here today... Stephen Hodges, he wrote the comics for several years, and at some point they ended up at Devil's Due, where he started to do miniseries and everything. We'll get to those in the next episode. What we have here are three one-shots, where Stephen kind of wanted to fill in the gaps, now that there's these lingering gaps in terms of where was Michael, what all happened over those 20 years, it's setting in to fill that void. So we have three one-shots here. We got One Good Scare, Autopsis, which I'm hoping is how it's pronounced, and Sam. Quick question, J.D. Is Stephen Hutchinson someone that you had ever heard about before this point? No, not until you told me this is what we're reviewing. He's from the UK. He was very active in the online Halloween fan community starting in the late 90s. I don't know if he founded the HalloweenMovies.com website or if he was just a very prominent contributor to it, but a lot of these comics directly tie back to that website. And in 2006, he produced and directed an entire franchise retrospective documentary, Halloween 25 Years of Terror. And you know those big franchise retrospectives that they had on like Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th and all that? Mm -hmm. This was kind of what started the ball rolling on that. You know, where those are like four to seven hours long, he managed to do it in 86 minutes. (laughs) No. I haven't seen the Halloween one, so I cannot comment on it, unfortunately. Neither have I. It's actually a little trickier to find. I don't know why it's gotten out of print a little bit in recent years. 25 Years of Terror was released in 2006, despite the fact that it was almost about 30 years by that point. I think it was because it just took a while to find distribution. But yeah, back in 2003, he had decided, I'm going to write my own Halloween comic book and had enough connections within the actual Halloween franchise with the Akkads, with some of the other producers, to actually get a limited license to do Halloween One Good Scare, which was largely self-published as a convention exclusive because they were doing a big Halloween 25th anniversary convention. Interesting. This was planned to be the first of an eight-issue series. Those other seven issues did not come out, though I'm assuming some of that material was folded into what came later. 
because there's several years between issues that we're going to be covering today. Yeah, we'll get into it as we go along, but it seems like he's setting up a bit of his own mythos and continuity in these stories. Yeah, there's definitely ties. Right. I'm assuming that there's not much that was lost that he didn't get to tell. I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear from him if it was. But yeah, it was a one-shot issue. All of the art was done by Peter Fielding, and I can't find any other comics that he's done outside of this and a couple of the covers from the Devil's Due era. Peter Fielding is actually still an active illustrator in deviant art, though, and you can find his art under the name Salvation, which is Salvation with a G. Uh, okay then. One Good Scare is related to us by David Loomis, the son of Sam, who followed in his father's footsteps as a psychiatrist and now also works at Smith's Grove Sanitarium. What a coincidence. As he struggles to come to terms with his father's obsessions and the mythos of Michael Myers, including a flashback bit where Elder Loomis confronted a young Michael with a gun, we also hear of a new patient in the form of Lindsay Wallace, who, 25 years ago, was one of the children being watched by Laurie Strode when Michael attacked. Over the course of several sessions, David gains her trust enough for her to open up that the reason for her paranoia is that she had seen Michael the previous Halloween, staring at her through a window after leaving her a jack-o'-lantern pierced with multiple knives. She took it as a warning that she's his latest target, and come the current Halloween, she has a freakout severe enough to be restrained in a suicide ward with David struggling to calm her down. Even when she promises to be good if he undoes the restraint, she still makes a run for it, only for Michael to indeed be present, the severed heads of slain sanitarium staff hanging from his hand. After failed attempts to break out of the secure facility, David ultimately hides under a desk while Lindsay faces Michael alone. She's mortally wounded and dragged before David as a sign that he's next as Michael leaves with her. Lindsay's body is later found strung up in a pumpkin patch, pierced with knives just like that jack-o'-lantern. So JD, do you recommend One Good Scare? I do. This might be one of my favorites out of all the ones that we've done so far in these Carpenter comics. It's not perfect. The art isn't... It's not bad. It's not my favorite. And I'm not sure I really think we needed to have David Loomis in the story. <laughs> but it tells a short story. It doesn't overextend itself longer than it needs to. And it uses the pacing well. It doesn't overuse Michael Myers. And it tries to set up a tone that I think is very reminiscent of the first movie. So, yeah, I like it. I'm not going to go far enough to recommend it, but there's a lot of it that I do like. Mostly my hold off is I really don't like the art. The pages are paced well, but I'm going to credit that more to the writer because that seems to be a constant. But there's times where the framing of the art actually kind of left me a little confused, especially in the climax as to what actually was happening. And I just think the art's also really ugly to look at. It's very good atmospheric art, captures the atmosphere, but it's just not that good. And it looks like that type of art that is heavily photo referenced. It does, but it also looks really smudgy and loose. Yeah, it's a weird amalgamation of that. Yeah. And I think that doesn't really do it any favors. It has that stiffness that you get with heavily photo referenced stuff, but it doesn't look as attractive as like... Like the guy who does Starman, yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, Tony Harris, yeah. A lot of that stuff, you can get at least a certain detail or whatever. This is just because it's so smudgy looking, it doesn't look as detailed and it just kind of looks unnatural. Right. And not in a good way. Well, and then there's times where it's like Loomis will look like a completely different person from panel to panel. Yeah. I also, I agree that I don't know that we needed the character of David Loomis, especially since as subsequent issues are going to reveal, that kind of actually feels like a weird continuity hiccup. Like, where did he get this son? It doesn't really add anything to the story no. of flashing back to Sam Loomis. It could have been someone who studied under him. It could have been someone who was just another doctor. There's no real need for, I mean, yeah, he's following his father's obsessions, but he's doing it by reading notes, which anyone could do. Right. You know, like, it could be Tommy Wallace, you know? Yeah. I will say I did like that they brought Lindsay back because yeah. it's always felt like they brought her back in that one movie where she was the friend of Jamie's stepsister. Yeah, briefly. She, yeah, she shows up for like one scene. I always thought like, oh, that's somewhere they could go. And they had her in the last comic series we read too. I like the fact that Michael comes back for her and he kind of teases her a little bit with the jack-o'-lantern, which he didn't do a whole lot in the movies, but I always liked it when he kind of set up a little bit of stage work, yeah. like with the tombstone in the first film. So this kind of made sense to me. But no, I mean, like speaking of Lindsay, I do think there's a good story at the core of this. I do think it's an interesting character study that does actually explore the fact that Michael has still been lurking on the fringes and how he treats his victims. It's not just about killing people, it's about terrorizing them. And I like the writing. I actually really like Stephen Hutchinson's writing. 
I like the way he uses the pros of the captions to really build mood, to build a pace, to really pull you into a scene. I want to recommend it. I think it is worth it. I'm going to go ahead and recommend it. It is worth a read. It's just be aware the art's not very good. Right. The art was the biggest stumbling block for me as well. I've read this a couple times now, and I don't mind it as much the second time, but it's definitely not great art. I mean, there are moments that look pretty decent. Like, I think sometimes with, like, the Michael Myers mask, where it's all heavily shadowed, that kind of works. But that's because that smudgy style, I think, fits that character and that mask really well. But when you have human faces, it just looks... I don't know. It's almost too cartoony and not cartoony enough at the same time. The only one that really worked for me, there's that moment where you just have like multiple shots of young child Michael's face Mm. just staring there. And then you have that one moment where there's a tiny little smirk Mm -hmm. to his lips and eyebrows, just his tiny little reaction. I've always preferred a Michael that has some level of, even though he's like restraining it, who has some level of emotion to his actions and some level of motive. Yeah. He's actually doing something instead of just killing everyone like a Terminator. Right. In the films, they've had almost a different body artist every time. I don't want to say actor because I don't know if that's really... I mean, it's physical acting. I mean, there's some films where they have multiple, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I think they do really great physical acting. And sometimes it's just a guy who's just walking around. A big guy. <laughs> yeah. They get a big guy and that's all they need because he looks intimidating. And that's fine. But I think there is a subtlety that I think, especially in that first film and some of the other ones, where there is some really good physical acting going on. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to do when you're just talking about somebody who, for the most part, has a very blank expression because of the mask and for the most part just walks around and stabs people. Right. So when you can get that, it's really cool. And I think he kind of does that in this series. Like, it's not just the child Michael. I think there are some moments where you get some expression from Michael in this comic, even though, like I said, the art could be better, but the expression works, I think. One thing, and I'll say this throughout all three issues that I like about Stefan, is he understands that Michael is having fun. That Michael is not just this stoic, cold-blooded killer. He's playing games. He's setting up tableaus. He's taunting and mocking. And he's genuinely trying to make people suffer, not just kill them. Mm -hmm. And that goes right back to the first film where he throws a sheet and a pair of glasses over his head and sneaks into a room, leading a girl to think it's her boyfriend, you know? Right. He plays games. He's a child, an evil child. Yeah, And that's really what this whole issue is about, is one good scare. It's He doesn't just want to kill you, which is something that the later films, I think, did way too much of. He wants to scare you. He wants to play trick-or-treats with you, except it's all tricks and they involve sharp objects. One one thing that I always like in certain films is he'll not only play that game with a victim, but then use that victim to create suffering for other victims, for suffering for other victims. And we get that here where he spent a year basically driving Lindsay insane with fear that he's coming to get her. And then he finally comes and gets her, but then he kills her in a way that also then makes the doctor suffering by dragging her in front of where the doctor's hiding and then start cutting into her, forcing the doctor to watch. It's this constant escalation of stringing along victim to victim to victim to victim and using victims to lead to other victims. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that they don't overuse Michael. Like, he's not in most of the story. It's mostly, like, David talking to Lindsay, David referring back to notes of his father's research on Michael. But for the most part, it's the very end of the story and then the flashbacks to Sam and young Michael. Comics are such a different animal as far as film. With film, you can deliberately pace something. You know, it's going to hold for this many seconds and then Michael comes out of the shadows. You can't do that with a comic. So what he does is he teases it out just enough that you get that tension building that you can't get from just holding a shot to see Michael in the background or whatever. Well, and I think that's where he's using the writing really well. There's so much atmosphere to his captions. Mm -hmm. Also, the flashback structures are used really well to create this theme throughout of dread and loss reflecting back on all this death that's happened leading up to this point and dreading what further death is about to come. And I think that really sets the stage so that when you finally get that punch of, okay, he's come for you, now here's how you're going to die, it plays on that impact. Yeah. And also then leaves further dread and loss to the people who are left behind. Right. There's a scene where a couple of nurses are walking through the hospital and they notice that David's door is open in his office and they're like, I I thought he was with that one girl. 
You never see what happens to them. Oh, they're the severed heads. Right. But you never see them get killed. We didn't need to see that. Right. We see the one guy who he drives the knife down his throat. Right. That is your little bit of gore porn if you need that. But we don't need to see him stab a billion people because it's not necessary. The heads communicate it perfectly. Well, and then also you have that great thing of halfway through the issue, you get that striking image of the lit jack-o'-lantern with all the knives driven into it. And then, of course, you turn to the last page, and the last page is Lindsay strung out in the pumpkin patch with all the knives driven into her in the same pattern. Yeah. I think slashers are at their most effective when there's a sadness to the kills. There's a genuine sense of loss. Oh, yeah. And I think it helps that because he chose Lindsay as the victim, it's somebody that we know, even Mm -hmm. if it's somebody we knew primarily as a child in the original film. And didn't really do a whole lot in that film, but it's somebody that we have some sort of connection to. And so that way, losing her feels like a loss. Like her death feels much more like a loss than, well, let's just say like the entire cast of Halloween 8. That was one that I just was like rolling my eyes the entire time because I didn't like any of those characters. This was somebody who was likable because A, we knew her as a kid and B, she was just living a terrified life for the last year because of Michael's threat to her. Yeah, and she's been living in terror for a lot of her life because of what happened to her as a child. (laughs) Right. I kind of get the impression that she had been in and out of hospitals for a while, but she had more or less been doing okay. And then Michael chose that moment to warn her, and that was it. It uses the tension of that very well. And she's someone who is so afraid of this thing happening to her that you care for her, and then it still happens to her, and it just feels awful. Right. Like you said, it's sad, and it's uncomfortable because of that, but it's more effective because rather than choosing somebody that we have no real connection with. You even still feel bad about David, even as he like falls into cowardice, where you have that whole situation playing out in front of him, where Michael drags Lindsay in front of him and starts cutting into her, which we only hear about through the captions, and the only shot you have of her is her reaching out towards David. And meanwhile, he's just huddled in fear under a desk next to a dead body that's just staring blankly at him. Mm -hmm. There's some genuinely haunting stuff here. Yeah, I think this is probably the closest out of anything that we've read to the film it's based on. I think it's pretty close. I mean, I'm going to hold off judgment until we get to next episode. Yeah, and I, I've not read those, so I'd put a qualification on that statement. But so far, this is the one that really had gotten me the most excited. I was a little hesitant because when we've had a past case of a fan becoming a creator in the franchise, that led us to Daniel Ferrand's and Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. So I had a little hesitation about Stephen Hutchinson going from a fan to now he's a creator who gets to do his entire tie-in mythos. But this is a fantastic first start to really show that he actually does have a level of skill and depth to him Mm -hmm. that I think is very worthy of the original. Yeah, this is the one that made me most excited. I was like, oh, so the next few are by this guy. Well, we'll see where we go from here. I had my doubts, but this is a good way to kind of calm those. Yeah. So anything else you want to say about One Good Scare? No, I think that if you're really into the Halloween stuff, this is something that you should maybe look out for. I think it's free online at HalloweenMovies.com. If you want some more Halloween in your life, this is not a bad way to do that. I mean, it's on par with Northman Nightmare. Aww. (laughs) Don't go there. Though this makes me wish that Stephen Hutchinson had written that. (laughs) Uh, Yes, yes. Thank you. Take that, Steve Niles. My apologies, Steve Niles. My apologies for that thing that you got paid for to do (laughs) quickly and had very little freedom to do probably what you would want to do with that story. Damn you. (laughs) All right. So let's move on to Halloween Autopsis. So Autopsis came out three years later in 2006 and was actually released as an extra included on the DVD for Hutchinson's documentary Halloween 25 Years of Terror. The comic is again written by Hutchinson with art by Marcus Smith, and I can't find any other information on Marcus Smith. To be fair, it's a very generic name. Yeah. All I could find was like a werewolf girl sketch that he had done for an anthology collection, but I couldn't find any biographical info or any other work he's done. Marcus, if you're out there, let us know. How are you? You doing well? Are you eating? (laughs) Has your art gotten any better? Oh, we might have a disagreement. (laughs) Ah, uh, see. <laughs> Might. Not a huge one. We'll get there. Yeah. Atopsis is a character study of Patrick Carter. An avid film fan as a child, his perspective changed when he found his father, a theater usher, dead of a heart attack after a screening. And I will just take a side note here. If you disagree with any of what I'm about to say, let me know, because I had a bit of a hard time interpreting some of this issue. Yeah, I kind of see what you mean there. 
Growing up to be a photojournalist, he became fascinated with images of death as he became a steady drinker and fell into a lurid relationship with a woman whom he photographs during each tryst in an attempt to try to understand human relationships. I think. In 1993, he's hired to tail Dr. Loomis by a tabloid hoping to prove Michael is still alive and killing. And as Patrick follows the old burned man, he begins obsessing over the crime scene photo of Annie Brackett, feeling Michael perfectly captured and preserved her beauty and death. Breaking into Loomis's home, he finds photos of other women killed in the years since 1978, all in twisted ways similarly capturing and mocking their beauty. Patrick catches a meeting between Loomis and a bitter old Sheriff Brackett who feels the doctor can never truly appreciate the deaths caused by Michael because he's never lost anyone he's personally close to. As the meeting breaks up, Loomis addresses the bushes, with Patrick figuring he's been caught by Loomis like he had been earlier, but it turns out the doctor is addressing Michael who looms above Patrick. Throughout the issue, we've intercut with a morgue where doctors examine the remains of a mutilated body, and it turns out to have been that of Patrick. He died slow from numerous small, precise cuts and his eyes were removed, the sockets stuffed with rolls of film from where he kept snapping photos of his own death. In an epilogue, Loomis accepts an invitation from the nurse Marion to move in with her, setting up events for Halloween H2O. So JD, do you recommend Autopsis? No. It's not terrible, but the art didn't work for me as much as the last one, which we already discussed. We didn't really care for the last one a whole lot. I don't care for this main character in this story. He is pretty unlikable, and it feels like a lot of artistic douchebaggery, to be honest. It uses Michael pretty well in that he's mainly just off screen again for most of the story. But I don't find the rest of it interesting enough that I really care. It's not a strong not recommend, but I didn't care for this one as much. Yeah, and I, it's interesting. We'll get into our thoughts on the art in a second. It didn't bother me as much as it did you, but I also don't agree it's the best. The story, I think, it does some very interesting thematic stuff. I think it's very well constructed like the last issue was. But yeah, it's hinging on a character who we don't really care about. And I was surprised to see the movie actually came after this instead of before because it's basically the exact same character and thematic journey as the lead character in Midnight Me Train, which kind of largely kept me from getting into that movie, too. I think it has an interesting twist at the end. I think it has some interesting things that it suggests about violence, but it doesn't really get deep enough into it to really justify things. I'm not going to recommend it. I didn't dislike it terribly, but I'm not going to recommend it. I think it's just too disjointed. Yeah. It's a shame because I think the writer is, we've already seen that he can be really good. Yeah. On a technical side, the writing is very good. Yeah. On the technical side, I think it is really good here for the, I just really cannot stand this character. Yeah. He definitely has that douchebaggery thing of trying to find depth and meaning in stuff that doesn't really have that much depth and meaning. His whole relationship with Victoria, the woman that he keeps photographing while they screw in a hotel room, it's like he's trying to make some deeper, ponderous thing about, you know, this is some kind of representative of human experience. No, it's just you fuck her in a hotel room and take pictures of her. Yeah. <laughs> and it almost seems like mostly an excuse to have some really che cheesecake art. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. No, but the most detailed the artist ever gets is when he's drawing the woman when she's half naked. Like the rest, the amount of detail in the art is just really lacking, in my opinion. It's just very cartoony style, which works for some things. I, I like cartoony styles, but this just, to me, it looks very, I don't want to say amateurish, but it's journeyman. Cheap. It's cheap journeyman at best. I mean, I've seen way better art from people who are genuine amateurs. Probably that's what I'm going to guess Marcus Smith is, because like you said, you aren't able to dig up anything else on him. Well, And this is an indie comic that was done for a DVD extra, too. So Yeah. And then there are moments that I think look okay. When he actually puts time in on a panel to actually fully detail it, like some of the pictures of some of the victims of Michael, the photos that he studies, those actually are not bad. With like the woman who's stabbed with the scissors and the head of the beauty queen. I mean, they're dark and twisted, but they're nice looking photographs. Maybe that's trying to be the commentary. Like he only exists in a world where the only things that really are important are his photographs. And so they're the most detailed. Everything else is a little less clear to him because he has that lack of human interaction. But I think at large part, it was probably because the guy probably didn't know how to use Photoshop well enough to color it correctly. So the black and white stuff looks better. See, and where I'm going to disagree with you is I think the art 
it's very stylized art. It has a cartoony look. It has manga eyes. It has that kind of thick line flatness to it. But I think it is actually very good art for the style that it's using. I actually think it's framed very well. The page layouts are gorgeous. I think while it is very simplistic detailing, I think it's still done with a crispness to it and an expressiveness to it that I think really works. The argument that I would give into is, is this the right style for this book? Yeah. It's not that I think the art is badly done. I think the art is very well done to the point where I actually would like to see more comics by this guy. I just don't know that the style choice of the art is the right fit for this book and this story. In a way, I actually kind of like it because it's an interesting contrast in styles to have something so dark be done in kind of a bright cartooniness, but I can see why it's off-putting. Yeah, it really threw me off, to be honest. It really kind of hurt my enjoyment of this book. I don't think I would have loved it either way, because like I said, the main character is just completely unlikable. And even when they don't have him on panel, like when they have the big confrontation between Brackett and Sam Loomis, I'm not super loving it. it. I don't think it added a whole lot other than just making Loomis feel bad about things. Part of that is also they're setting up the next story, which we're going to be getting into. True. Actually, that whole page with Brackett is one of my favorite pages in the book because it's, again, dealing with loss and what's been lost and how hard it is to move on from that loss. And I actually think the art is gorgeous on that page with that one great shaded image of Brackett just hunched over and Loomis just kind of not knowing what to say or where to look, even as he says the wrong thing and Brackett starts tearing into him. I think it's such a human scene. And you had told me that the writer had intended to do more stories before or the license changed. Well, that I'm talking about the Devil's Due license. Well. We'll get into that next week. I think that he probably had more he wanted to tell with the story, as far as like Loomis and everything. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it adds a whole lot to this reading it as a one shot. I don't know. This was one that I was really kind of disappointed with because I loved the first one so much. And I just think that It almost feels a little bit more torture porny. Yes. There's a lot more graphic violence, which I'm not prudish against that, but I don't think... Again, the photos of the crime scenes and then the autopsy at the end. Right. And plus, when you have this character who is not likable, he talks about how he doesn't really love his girlfriend. He just loves taking pictures of her. Everything about him is so unlikable. It just reminds me so much of like a Saw film with the graphic violence and the big close up of his socketless eyes at the end. And it's uncomfortable and not in a way that the last story was uncomfortable because you really wanted Lindsay to live and seeing her die was so tragic. This is uncomfortable because it's just trying to gross you out and you don't like anybody except for setting up the Loomis storyline. See, and I disagree because what I liked about the violence in this, and it kind of ties into the whole theme of the awfulness of using violence to accessorize beauty almost, trying to use death to capture beauty and almost mock beauty at the same time. I actually thought those pages with him in his bloody eye sockets, I actually thought that was a fantastic visual, especially when you realize his sockets are filled with canisters of film of him filming himself getting killed. That's a perfect serial killer thing to do. Right. And we should make a note, just in case anyone's wondering, the title of the story, Autopsis, Mm -hmm. that means to look with one's own eyes. So it's both a reference to the fact that the story is about an autopsy, but also it's a cameraman who's trying to... uh, Feels divided from humanity and can only really look at it through a camera lens. Right. Even as he's dying, he's still looking at it through a camera lens. I think that actually works. Actually, after I looked that up, I did get a little bit more appreciation for that. I think that there's a couple of different layers it's working on, and I did kind of appreciate that. You actually have to look that up because probably most people will not understand what autopsy means. And so they're going to be like, they misspelled autopsy. But no, it was intentional. And I actually do think that's a pretty good use of the title. Yeah. And my only major issue with the book is I don't dislike the idea of the lead character. I don't dislike the themes that are explored through the lead character. I don't dislike his fate. But yeah, you just still don't like the character. It's like, it's a character who obviously has the interesting thing of he can't connect with humanity, but that also kind of makes him a character that's hard to connect to. Right. But one thing that I kind of like about Stephen Hutchinson with all three of these stories is he's using outsiders. A large part of these first two stories aren't following Loomis or Marion or any of these other people who were primary figures, especially leading into H2O. It's these outsiders kind of wandering in and 
what I liked about Bracket and Loomis and all that stuff is because you don't have any of those other sequels, it's an explanation of where have they been over those 20 years? What have they been up to? What have their lives been like? That's why I like those scenes that are in there. And I do think it could have used a better person to tell it, but I still like a lot of the ideas behind the character. I think if they had had one other character who could have served, like if they had fleshed out the girlfriend character or something else to provide a balance so that way we can see like how other people see him as opposed to how he just fails to understand the world around him, I think that would have worked better. The thing with the girlfriend is there's such a lurid quality to that relationship that I think that makes, especially the graphic deaths at the end, feel even more lurid because they're part of the same story. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where I think if you had toned down that relationship with the girlfriend or found a different angle to explore it with, the ending would have had more impact because this issue does feel kind of dirty, you know, and it is a little scuzzier and grimier and a little harder to warm to. Mm -hmm. But I think if you had kind of relegated that more towards the climax instead of just, oh, this guy's entire life is just kind of scuzzy and grimy. Yeah, I can see what he was trying to do. And there are parts I do enjoy. Like, I like it when Loomis calls out and the photographer thinks he's talking to him and he's actually talking to Michael and he realizes (laughs) that Michael's right behind him. That is an amazing reveal right there. Mm -hmm. Like, I was not expecting that when I read through this. There are parts I really enjoy. I I like the concepts of it. I just don't think it works as well as it should. Right. I don't think it fully stuck what it was trying to achieve. And plus, with the art failing it, it's not for me, but... I'm glad that you liked it. I <laughs> sort mostly. Well, again, I'm still liked it more than me. On the fence about whether I recommend it. I mean, this is one of those ones. I think in conjunction of all three of these stories, it's interesting to have the through line. But on its own, you don't really need to. I think it's going to be one of those ones where it's going to swing a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be like me, and a lot of people who are going to be like you. And I can totally see why. Yeah, it's all in the details, and whether or not those are details that work for you. You mean you might have to see it with your own eyes to make a decision? Or look at it through the lens of a podcast earbud? (laughs) Uh, no. No, how do you use your earbuds? I don't... No, 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 no. (laughs) Get those out of your eyes. But they fit so snugly in my tear ducts. Oh, God. And that's going to be interesting getting to the issues on the next episode, because I know very striking images of very graphic violence, mostly against women, are going to be a recurring thing through Stephen Hutchinson's run. Hmm. I like that Lindsay was built as a character in the last one, but it was still kind of gruesome the fate she met. The women in this story aren't treated particularly well. There's going to not be particularly great treatment of women in the next story. And not so far that I would say problematic, because it fits kind of the themes of what Michael has done in the past. But at least in this one, he's killing a guy. I don't know. Yeah. I don't quite know where I'm going with that. It's You raise a good point, though. There's a line that you got to be careful how you tow in terms of how brutal you want to get, especially when you're making such a deep theme about the fact that he wants people to suffer. Right. And unfortunately, just because of the nature of the, because he's building off the H2O universe. And so therefore, he can't do anything with Lori. So he kind of has to work with Loomis for the most part. At Mm -hmm. least I'm guessing that's the reason why two out of the three stories we're covering today are focused on Loomis. And even then, the other one had a tie with considering it was his son. So I think that his supporting cast is going to be Marion. It's going to be people important to him. And I guess it's easier to have a woman be your supporting cast. But it does run into that women in refrigerators type thing. And the fact that the other women in this particular comic is not especially well used either. Yeah, she's just cheesecake photo prop. And again, it would have been nice to have built her as an actual character instead of just that. Right. But then again, she probably would have then been killed. (laughs) Probably. Right. And women in refrigerators, I think, is something that people are too quick to label everything under. But it's definitely a discussion that I think needs to be had, especially with the three stories we have. And I think we're about ready to move into the third one. I'm ready. Let's talk some Sam. Sam was done right around the same time. I don't know if it was ever intended to be a comic or if it was just always meant to be a short story. But Atopsis has a link to where you can download Sam as the next chapter in the story. Sam is written by Stephen Hutchinson. While it is a prose story, it does have illustrations by Marcus Smith. And because I read it right before we recorded, I did not have a chance to do a synopsis. So let me just see if I can wing one out real quick. 
The framing device is set in 1995. It's the year Dr. Loomis dies and it's starting to lead directly into the events of H2O. It involves a lot of him looking back at his past, at when he started the Myers case, helping Laurie Strode fake her death and go off in the new role of Carrie Tate. Just kind of filling in a lot of the gaps over time. A lot of his interactions with Michael. There's even a, a bit where he talks about the taste of a gun the first time he put one in his mouth. And then through that framing device, we also get the story of Elizabeth Worthington. Sam, back in his World War days, actually spent time in a prisoner of war camp during World War II. And he's known suffering a lot of his life, but he's always had a nice dark sense of humor. And that led to him having a relationship with Elizabeth Worthington back in Britain throughout the 40s and 50s. But then he left her behind when he came to America. And despite the fact that they never saw each other again, she would always pay attention to news articles and how everything was going. And at one point here, Michael has a heart... Michael. <laughs> God, Michael having a heart attack. That would be an interesting way to go. <laughs> <laughs> she, she learns that Sam had a heart attack and decides it's time for me to come to America and just finally see him and we can put to rest our old demons and all our old feelings. And of course, as she gets there, right as she's outside his house, Michael grabs her. <laughs> and of course, as Loomis is in the hospital room, still recovering from a heart attack, even though he knows he's probably going to die from it finally. And Michael is there. And he's trying to put to rest his demons with Michael. But of course, Michael has Elizabeth cut up, bound into a chair, and he starts torturing her with a knife while making Loomis watch. It ultimately ends up with Loomis going on a big speech about how this is all because you weren't able to kill Lori, isn't it? It ultimately drives Michael to just leave the room. But as he leaves, Loomis finds carved into Elizabeth's back the name Carrie Tate, realizing that Michael has known all along that Lori faked her death and now he's going after her. Loomis is found dead in the hospital room the next day, which has been fully cleaned, all clear of blood, and people just think he died of a heart attack. And Elizabeth was never heard from again. So do you recommend Sam? I do. I didn't love it as much as I liked One Good Scare. I liked it more than I liked Autopsis. It's kind of a middle ground. I think a lot of it seems to cover things that if you've watched the movies, you should already know. Some of it I really enjoyed going into the history of Sam Loomis, and some of it I just thought was not as effective use of the material as it could be. For the most part, it's pretty decent, though. Considering that the chapter illustrations are done by the same artist who I didn't like last time, I thought those were pretty good. <laughs> well, it's because he's doing the black and white, highly detailed version. <laughs> yeah. The front cover with the black rose and you see Michael and Loomis in the blood that's in the background, I think is really cool. But the rest of the story, it's okay. I don't love it as an ending to Sam Loomis's character, but we'll probably get into that as we go along. It's not, not recommend, but it's not a bad. If you want to seek it out, it, you could do a lot worse. And my main issue with this and picking up the threads of what we were just talking about is I do think Elizabeth Worthington does fall into the woman in refrigerator trope. She was created entirely so she could be brutally mauled in front of Loomis just to make him suffer. Right. I mean, I almost think it would have been more powerful had she come only to learn that Loomis had died. And so she just goes back to her life. Instead, we're focusing on her getting all sliced up. Michael's gouging out an eye in graphic detail. The whole carving Laurie's new name into her back. It's just this woman has been created entirely so Michael can do this to her in front of Sam and give final word to that theme in Sheriff Brackett's conversation where it's like, you've never lost anyone to Michael who was close to you. Here's a thought. What if this had been David? Yes. We have that first chapter that would have paid that off where this is set a year after One Good Scare. And then David is, like, distant from his dad. He's not checked up on him. When he can't face him because he cowered in front of Michael instead of facing him like his dad would. Right. And then Michael brings David. I think that would have been a much more effective. Oh, that would have been great. And it would have paid off that first story. Admittedly, this is something that maybe he didn't want to have people have to read that one comic to get the full context of it. Well, he does have it available on the website right next to this one. So. Right. And maybe he thought this might sell it somewhere mm. or something, but I think that would have made this a lot better. And I like the character of Elizabeth. 
I just think what happens to her is so, like you said, it's very women in a refrigerator. And considering she serves no other point than to be introduced as a lost love. It's lingering, brutalized torture just to make this guy suffer. Right. Again, it would have probably worked better had she been a care. I mean, like, even if you had, you couldn't have made it Marion because then that would upset H2O. But no, David would have been perfect because then you would have had a perfect bridge between all three of these stories. Mm -hmm. I like, yeah, that backstory of their time in England and following World War II. I kind of like the little nod of he was in a prisoner of war camp because Donald Pleasance was one of the stars of The Great Escape. Yeah, I think it also just works just as a way to show like how Loomis has always kind of been surrounded by darkness and that early in his life they met during the bombings in London and then he got captured as a POW. They talk about how he traced like a child killer before he moved to America. Yeah. It, I kind of like a lot of the little details he adds. How he always had this kind of longing towards darkness, and that's kind of what led him to Michael. Right. Like it was almost always his destiny to run into him and to be involved in his life. I think that part works really well, but having this character whose only purpose is just there to show up right as he's dying and then get killed herself. Just literally invent a love of Loomis's life <laughs> so he can watch her die. And to be fair, I get the impression that it was almost like she was more into him than he was into her. They say like he was involved with another woman at the time. When she's not David's mom, so obviously he has had other relationships. Right. But no, I think, no, your idea of making it David would have been so much more interesting because one of the other things that One Good Scare is lacking is that while they've created Loomis as son, most of his flashbacks involving Loomis are not about their relationship. Right. They're all about Loomis and Michael, and it would have been nice to then use the room that you would get in this story to then explore what was it like growing up as a child being raised by Loomis. Loomis. What was their actual father-son relationship like? How did that evolve over the years? How did they yeah. have their falling out? How was this them trying to reconnect? You know, that would have been fantastic. Yeah. And you still could have gotten those details about he was from a prisoner of war camp, the baby killer. Those were all things that he found out as a child of this man. Yeah. And you could see like how he, on one hand, kind of admire his father and wanted to go into his field of practice. And yet at the same time, find that because of his reputation and also hurting his career, and other things like there's a lot of ways you could go with that and then make it feel like a lot more of a natural outgrowth because it yeah. was a character who was introduced in a different story and not feel like it was just invented just to ratchet up the emotional drama right and then even just to have that contrast of every single time sam encounters michael he dives in and fights michael or instantly confronts him he never hides from michael and that's the one thing that david did in the one time he ever encountered michael he hid from him and I just think that fascinating character, he spent so much of his life living in his father's shadow and trying to become his father. And then ultimately, when the moment called for it, he couldn't live up to it. Yeah. And it's like, that would have been a fantastic character study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they even referenced David. So, like, I wonder if it ever occurred to him to even, like, try to do that. Because I think that would have worked so much better. I wonder if David's going to be in the next episode's issues. We'll see. We'll see. That was my big problem with the first. It was the fact that there was no point to it being Loomis's son. This would have given him a point, yeah. Yeah, that would have paid off brilliantly. And it would have made this story a lot less uncomfortable. Yeah, and it would have completed a nice trilogy bridge. I think it would have actually helped Autopsis even have a bit more meaning as a middle chapter. Chapter, you know, I, I think that would have been great. I still like the story for the most part. I actually think Stephen Hutchinson's writing style translates to prose very well. Yeah. It still has this nice, very precise, very atmospherically lyrical quality to it. Yeah, it's lyrical without being too purpley in its right. prose. And again, a lot of it is about memory and about getting lost in memory and thought and themes and all that stuff. So I have a question. What did you think of the ending? Because I don't understand... Did Michael clean up the hospital and just make it look like it was a heart attack and get rid of the body of Elizabeth? Yes. That's the impression I got because this was in the beginning of the year. This wasn't Halloween. If he had left a body there with the name Carrie Tate on it, everyone's going to suddenly start looking for Carrie Tate. So I'm just picturing Michael Myers with a, with a mop. His mask on and a mop, just mopping the floor. He puts his hair in a little cleaning net. <laughs> the mask's hair. He has his little spritz <laughs> bottle. Oh... Uh... I almost thought like maybe they're setting up, maybe not the Cult of Thorn, but like maybe mm. there's something that was going to come up. And maybe we'll see in the next stories, but... Don't want to spoil that for you. 
But no, and that's what's also going to be interesting is I don't know because these were largely done independently. And then the ones we're going to cover in the next issue were all done for Devil's Due. Is there going to be a continuity between these issues and those issues? That'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm curious because I actually do kind of like the little universe that he's built up. Yeah. This story has references. He mentions the beheaded beauty queen that was saw in Atopsis in this story. And it, I kind of like that because I've always liked continuity between stories. And it's obviously it helps that it's written by the same person, but it makes it feel like there's a point to it all. And that's why I'm so disappointed that it's not David instead of Elizabeth. <laughs> Because they would have paid that off so brilliantly. No, and now I am too. But no, and I like that that is a given of his writing style, and I want to see that continue of how he'll use new story elements to flesh out old story elements. Right. And look back on a reveal edition. And again, one of the big things about H2O, which we got into on our episode on it, is how now there is that whole gap of, well, what happened in those 20 years? Because Loomis is already dead at the beginning of H2O. Did he die back then? Did he die later? This is a nice story for where did Loomis go? Yeah. And what happened to him? I don't know if this is the perfect ending, but at least I kind of like that idea that it's widely accepted that Michael's been dead and that he's been quiet for the last 20 years. But no, he's actually still been going around killing people, but he's just been doing it in a wandering fashion because he can't kill that one person that he's wanted to kill all these years. Right. And I kind of like that Loomis is starting to trace it. The tabloid newspaper that the one guy is working for are starting to realize these patterns, you know, and that's all kind of leading up to H2O, where it's ultimately going to come to a head. Right. I kind of like that these give further weight and depth to H2O. Yeah, and I think in that way it pays off really well. And I agree that this may not be like how I would necessarily want to see Loomis written out of this, but it's, I guess, better than he just died of natural causes years later. Or at least it's more interesting. I don't know if it's better. Right. And I kind of like the idea that Michael had learned about Lori. And like I said, I do kind of like it when Michael is a little bit of a showman. Mm -hmm. I don't like what he did to Elizabeth, but the fact that he made a big show of it just to to rub it in Loomis's face. Just to say goodbye and I'm going to fuck with yeah. you a little more type way. Right. To say, look, I know she's alive and I'm going to find her. And like you said, rub it in his face. I think that part works really well. By the way, I just realized why it couldn't be David. Why? Because that story is set after this, after his father's already died. Yeah, but they could have fixed that. Yeah. They could have wiggled around that. Or something. I mean, they could go back and say that that was, you know, they could fix that maybe in this, I don't know how long between when that story was written and this one, but I would make that story still so much better if they had just done that. No, I agree. God, that would have been great. Man, now you got me disappointed on that. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. That's a perfect observation. Well, it's just the fact that it would have fixed problems with both stories. And admittedly, it's really easy to look in hindsight. I'm sure right. when he was writing the story, it didn't seem that was necessary. But I, I think it would have really worked really well. One thing I will give Stephen Hutchinson praise for is this doesn't read like fan fiction. No. I don't mean that conception. I mean like technical wise. It doesn't read like fan fiction is typically written. It has a mm -hmm. polish to it. It has a level of depth and skill to it. So much fan fiction is largely about fans have a specific thing that they want to like trump up or a specific ship they want to explore or make everything a happy ending. This is trying to actually take a very dramatic character study look at tragedy and death and loss and all that stuff. But I wonder how much of what we're bringing up is just due from inexperience as a writer, because these are like the first comics he's ever done. Right. I mean, like if he had maybe a couple more years of comics under his belt, could he have maybe thought to connect those threads a little better? And I mean, I enjoyed enough of this one and most of One Good Scare that I really think he does have a really good potential to become a really good writer. Like you said, yeah. I think a lot of what our issues are just stuff that probably would be fixed with just a little bit more experience and a little bit more time. What, and I think he also probably didn't have the input of an editor because these were very indie produced. Yeah. Someone who could just say, you know, maybe if you explore this angle a little better or something like that. Yeah, there's no editor listed on the credits. So I'm going to guess that this was probably more or less self-published. For an independently produced trio of comics by people who had never done anything like this before... I find all three surprisingly admirable. Yeah. To the point where I would like to see more work from most everyone who was involved in all three. Yeah, even the artist from Autopsis, I would like to see him do other stuff. Even the artist from One Good Scare, maybe. Actually, his DeviantArt page, he's got a really good style now. 
That's the thing with talking about, especially like these really low budget independent things. They probably just didn't have that much experience when they got hired. When they weren't even hired for these, they were largely the driving force of, hey, we could put these together. Can we have your permission to? Because mm-hmm. they were doing a convention. Hey, can we do a comic for the convention? They were doing a DVD. Hey, can we do a comic for the DVD? You know, and then Sam was just kind of like a little extra tag. It's interesting that fans were able to throw together what they did, and I think this is of a quality that is a bit better than you usually get when fans do something like that. And I actually praise them for that. You know, God, in terms of like my recommend is it's tied up in all three of like the Chaos Comics issues. I kind of want to look at all three of them as like a little trio together. I mean, I can see why you would want to. One Good Scare and I think Sam, I think, feel more of like One Piece than Atopsis. Atopsis sets up a lot of stuff that's paid off in Sam. Right. It has a lot more continuity ties to Sam than One Good Scare does. Tone-wise, I think that this feels a l- well, I don't know. Then I think about all the stuff that happens to Elizabeth and I think that kind of fits with some of the things that we complained about in Atopsis as far as like its treatment towards women and everything. I could see it as one big piece. And part of this is where I almost want to wait until the next episode to make a final pronouncement because I want to see how do these lead into the stuff we're going to cover that time, given that there is still such a direct tie to them. Right. I guess if I had to rate all three of them together, I would say a recommend just because I think there's enough style here and enough skill that I think it's probably worth your time. Even with Atopsis, which I didn't really love as much as you did. Yeah, Atopsis is still the weakest of the three for me. You enjoyed it more than I did. I think that still, as a little trilogy of independent stories, I've read way worse from professionals. Yeah, the Chaos comics. Yeah, well, and <laughs> some of the stuff like the Dark Horse stuff we read with The Thing. And I still kind of like the Chaos comics for Halloween, but they were a lot messier than... This is so much cleaner. Right. God, Stefan just has such a clean writing style. I love his writing. Yeah. It feels like it's all one piece. Yeah. I'm really excited for the next episode. Yeah. I was not looking forward to any of these, and they were a pleasant surprise. Like, horror is one of those things that Mm -hmm. sometimes is really hard to do on a comic. I've read some good horror comics, but it's almost always the exception rather than the rule, because usually it's just like, oh, here's a big splash of guts on the page, or here's just some really muddy-looking art, because they're trying to obscure the mood, and I don't love it most of the time, but this is not bad at all. This is pretty solid. And I think the skill is, because, you know, we were talking so much of the problem with, like, translating a slasher film is you can't really do the chase very easily in a comic page. But this Mm -mm. does a great job of just kind of not even trying that and just focusing on atmosphere, mood, and theme, and then these momentary punches, Mm -hmm. you know, where you suddenly turn a page and it's like, oh, my God. It does a nice job of building and building and building them punch. It's not trying to maintain a pace throughout or anything like that. This is how you do horror in comics. It's doing a very comic book style of horror as opposed to trying to recapture a film style of horror. Yes. This is like how the old EC stories were written. It's somebody who's clearly, like, for a guy who's, as far as I know, had not really written any comics before this, he did a really good job of making a good, effective horror comic, which is something that, like I said, I've read comic pros who have been in the industry for years who can't do that as well as what I've read here. Yeah. Even if I have some issues with some of it, I gotta give the guy credit. He did a really good job. And again, it's stuff that would make me want to see what else they've done in the subsequent years. Sadly, they haven't. We'll get to that in the next episode. So yeah, any final thoughts you want to offer on this trio? No, I think that, like I said, if what we said has intrigued you at all, and considering, like you said, I think are all these on the website? I don't know if Atopsis is. I know Sam and One Good Scare are Atopsis. I would hope it would be. I don't know if there's something tying it up. But if you can find them and you're interested... Yeah, they're pretty easy to find. I would say check it out. Even Atopsis, which, I, like I said, I didn't love. It's a quick enough read that it's not going to hurt you to check it out. And that's where I'm going to... Again, I'm going to wait just to see how they tie into the next episode. But, you know, I'm genuinely looking forward to the next episode, which I didn't expect to say. Yeah, me either. I kind of liked a little bit of the Chaos Comics stuff, but this has got me a lot more excited for the next episode. Chaos Comics stuff was the least interesting. It wasn't yeah. very good, but it was interesting. I mean, that's more than what we could say for some of the other <laughs> entries in the long box carpentry. North Man Nightmare. That's still, like, the worst thing we've covered. <laughs> So, I guess we'll see you next time. In the long box? I, no. I was going to say another view from the long box, but that's already another show. <laughs> we'll put another nail in the long box next time. <laughs> so long. Have a good one. <laughs> 
Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>